So obstetric and gynecological patients. This is also a topic that's required um, almost on nearly on a yearly basis from from both the Kentucky Board of EMS and the National Registry. Um, but I, I tried to change it from what our, our previous lectures were so that we weren't really looking at gynecological emergencies. We were starting to look more at obstetric emergencies. Um, but either way, uh, it would be unfair to, to not start off this section by talking about the assessment of the gynecologic patient. So uh, obstetric complaint, this is really the some of the questions in addition to, of course, all of our regular ones and normal ones that we would expect to ask every single patient. These are some other things that, that should be on our radar. So total number of pregnancies carried a term um, previous deliveries, were they cesarean or vaginal? Um, because that's going to tell us the, the likelihood of us uh, if it is a uh, if it is an OB patient and we are nearing delivery, are we going to be um, facing any, any challenges if it was a previous C-section? Um, last menstrual cycle, when did it start? When did it stop? Was it regular? Possibility of pregnancy. Remember with, with this question in, in, in particular, although arguably all of these questions, this rings true. Remember where you're at and remember your surroundings when you're when you're answering the or asking these questions. Um, especially if uh it's a younger female patient, um, and mom or dad are in the room or a brother or sister are in the room. Um, a lot of these questions can wait until we get out into the medic unit and, and hopefully can provide some privacy for for the patient to be able to, to answer some of these questions. So are you sexually active? Is there a chance you could be pregnant? Um, remember, if it is a female patient of childbearing age, um, there is a chance they could be pregnant, right? Depending on if they're sexually active or not. The youngest patient I've ever had who was pregnant was 12 years old um, in, a, in a previous position um, that, that I had with, it, with a different city. Um, so unfortunately, um, remember that... Uh, uh, it's not just 18, 19, 20, 22 year olds that uh, that should be asked this question. Um, blood loss. Is there present blood loss? If so, how much? What color? How many pads per hour? Uh, that's something that we're going to talk about a little bit more. I have a video on the next slide. Um, I think it'll play. Hopefully you guys can hear the audio, even though it's not incredibly important. But that has always been a, a question that in EMT class, when I took EMT class and I went to paramedic school, um, those were things that that question specifically seemed to kind of be drilled into our heads when it came to the ob gyne patient. Well, if you're bleeding, how many pads per hour? Um, and my personal opinion is that question has zero merit on estimating blood loss. Um, and we'll look at a video why uh, on the next slide, I believe. Contraceptive use, are you using it? Um, if so, is it birth control pills? Is it an IUD? Is it because, uh, is it through tubal ligation? Is it from a contraceptive implant? And what I'm talking about there um, is the implant that goes in the bicep of the uh, of the patient's arm. There's a lot of different methods through contraceptive use um, out there. Some of them present um, different risks uh, than others, uh, but it's but it's good information for us to know. So especially with uh, and I'm anyone in paramedic school here, take note um, if you have that. Um, uh, quote unquote, younger female patient, uh, you know, 20, 22, 25 year old female that is a smoker and is on birth control pills. And all of a sudden she's having a sudden onset of difficulty breathing, or maybe it's um, um, her breathing has been getting worse and worse over the last few hours. And now it's an emergency. Uh, we need to be thinking pulmonary embolism. So anytime we have a, uh, a female patient, childbearing age, they're on birth control, Smoking adds to the risk. We need to be thinking of pulmonary embolism, birth control. Um, some of them work through different methods, uh, but with increased estrogen levels, increased estrogen and progesterone can both cause um, clotting. So when we have increased estrogen levels, we have increased progesterone levels, and we do um, other things that increase our risk naturally of getting blood clots, you know, a previous surgery that made us bedridden smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, whatever it may be, um, keep pulmonary pulmonary embolism up there in the, in the forethought of your brain. So how many pads per hour are you using? So that question. So most pads hold between 20 and 50 milliliters of fluid, um, but there are a lot of different pads that are on the market right now. And I'm going to play this video. Today we're going to show the maximum absorbency of first day's pads. 
every syringe contains 60 milliliters of fake blood. Hundred and twenty milliliters of fake blood. You can see how quickly it's absorbing into the pad by the by the color change. So that's where it ends. Um, so 150 milliliters, this particular type of, of, of pad will hold. So again, most pads, um, if you look at manufacturers, um, uh, what they say on the box is between 20 and 50 milliliters of fluid before they need to be, before they're fully saturated and they need to be switched out. Um, this particular pad will hold 150 milliliters before uh, it is full and is no longer holding fluid. That is a huge difference, right? So that how many pads per hour are you using? Unless you're going to take a deep dive into uh, what's the brand and is it a regular pad or a lightweight pad um, or a uh, uh, another type of pad that is designed to hold way more fluid, it's really not going to be beneficial in estimating blood loss. So it could be 20 milliliters a pad or it could be 150 milliliters per pad. Um, you're, you're really not getting a ton of great information when you ask that question. So just keep that in mind. It's something that all of us have probably been been uh, been taught at some point or another, but it doesn't really carry a ton of merit in, in some situations. So history of pregnancy. So pregnancy terminology, gravita, that's the total number of pregnancies, including their current one if they are currently pregnant. So if mom has had, has been pregnant three times and now she's pregnant again, um, that is a gravita of four, right? She's had three other births. Those were the, um, she's had no spontaneous abortions. All pregnancies have gone well. She's got three kids at home. She's pregnant now. She has a gravita of four. Term, this is the number of uh, pregnancies that were carried to term, to full term. Para is the number of live births after 20 weeks. Uh, and then abortions is the number of spontaneous and or therapeutic um, uh, abortions that the, that the patient has had. So something that can that can trip you up if a patient gives you this information or if you ask it, um, generally we expect gravita to either be um, equal to or higher than para, which is the number of live births. Um, but just remember, if one of those was a twin pregnancy or a triplet pregnancy, um, you can actually the the patient can actually have more live births. Um, than they can have total number of pregnancies. So don't be confused by that if you see that. Um, on a test question, or if you see that on a patient's chart, or if a patient tells you that, yep, I have uh, five kids at home and I've been pregnant four times, you know, our initial uh, reaction is going to be, well, wait, that doesn't make sense. But one of those is probably uh, twin pregnancy. Physical examination. So again, this is in continuation of the gynecological assessment that, that we previously talked about. Looking at the patient's abdomen, do we see any previous uh, surgical scars that would indicate previous C-sections? Do we see any gross deformities? Um, identifying fundal height, which we're going to talk about on the next slide. Vaginal exam, we would only do this when it's absolutely necessary. Um, for me, that is when the patient says, uh, I feel the urge to push, right? And I need to look to see if the patient's crowning or not. If at all possible, try to have a female provider perform this, um, but minimally at least have a witness in the back of the medic unit when, it, um, when you do this. Uh, it just pro provides a little bit more pr protection and probably comfort for both you and the uh, and the patient. So uterine evaluation fundal height. So the fundus is the top of the uterus and almost feels like a softball or like a pear um, under the skin, under the uh, at the belly there. So fundal height helps to determine gestational age. So um, if you or a, uh, a wife or girlfriend or sister or whoever uh, have been pregnant and you've gone to those appointments with them, one, one of the first things they do once you're back in the exam room 
um, is the doctor immediately starts pushing on mom's belly or the, or the pregnant female's belly to try to find that fundus. Uh, and it's essentially they'll measure um, that fundus down to the uh, uh, pubis symphysis to be able to figure out exactly how far along mom is and to be able to figure out is mom and baby um, growing like they need to in terms of gestational age. So once that fundus is able to be felt right above the symphys, uh pubis, uh, that's about 12 to 16 weeks pregnant. Once that fundus is at the height of the umbilicus or the belly button, that's about 20 weeks. And then for every week gestation um, that mom progresses in pregnancy, that fundal height will raise by one centimeter. So um, as you see here, the belly button's at 20 weeks, which isn't marked, but we go up two weeks from that, we're at 22 centimeters. Uh, as we go up eight weeks from the belly button, we should be about eight centimeters above the belly button, which is kind of right there in the middle of the abdomen. And as we continue to work our way up and we get near term, so somewhere around 38 to 40 weeks, that fundal height should actually be near the xiphoid process. And remember that xiphoid process is that little bone that hangs off the sternal body at the bottom. So that fundal height should be way up um, in mom's rib cage, just below that xiphoid process. So something that's very important to remember is immediately after delivery, that fundus will actually fall back down to the level of the umbilicus. So we talk about fundal height because uh, of estimating gestational age which we already spoke about, but we also need to know fundal height because um, a fundal massage might be something that's needed in order to help decrease postpartum hemorrhage. So if you've just delivered baby and mom is hemorrhaging, um, don't go immediately back up to the xiphoid process to try to find the fundus because it was just there five minutes ago. It's already worked its way back down as baby um, has been delivered. It's already worked its way back down to near the, the level of the belly button. And that's really where we should be trying to find the fundus so that we can begin the fundal massage so that we can cause uterine contraction and hopefully decrease postpartum hemorrhage. So this picture shows um, how that fundal massage happens. So the bottom hand is really just, once we find the fundus, putting the, cupping the bottom hand um, below it uh, for stability, and then taking the other hand on top and kind of uh, massaging that, that fundus or that top of the uterus is what it is. Um, between our uh, hands. Um, and again, that's causing uterine contraction, which will help decrease postpartum hemorrhage. Labor and delivery. So there are three stages of labor. So the first stage begins with contractions and it ends when the cervix is fully dilated to 10 centimeters. So from the time mom starts having contractions to the time she is fully dilated at 10 centimeters, that is stage one of labor. And there's different types or different stages of really within stage one. Early labor is when the um, cervix is dilated from zero to three centimeters. Active labor is when there's dilation to four to eight centimeters. And transitional labor, you've probably heard that phrase, is when dilation is between eight and 10 centimeters. Once mom gets to 10 centimeters, she's fully dilated. Now she goes to stage two. Stage two is full dilation of the cervix to delivery of the newborn. So baby delivery actually happens during stage two of labor. So um, this is generally, uh, we have full dilation, mom's contracting every two to three minutes. Those contractions are lasting quite some time, maybe 50 to 60 seconds at a time. Uh, we have mucus plug expulsion. Um, uh, and eventually we're gonna have crowning and, and deliver baby, which we'll talk about those steps here in a few moments. Stage three is delivery of the baby and ends when the placenta is expelled and the uterus has contracted. That can be anywhere from five to 60 minutes in length. So stage one is beginning of contractions to full dilation. Stage two is full dilation at 10 centimeters to delivery of the baby. Stage three is delivery of the baby um, has just occurred and now uh, mom has to deliver the placenta. So some signs um, of imminent delivery. So regular contractions that are 45 to 60 seconds in length at one to two minute intervals. <laughs> Remember that intervals are measured from, one from the beginning of one contraction to the beginning of the next. 
Um, contractions greater than five minutes apart, go ahead and transport. That truly depends on what where you're at. Um, that That's kind of a, a blanket number given by most protocols. It's given by most textbooks. Um, but truly, that's going to be your comfort level, and it's going to be um, you know, your, uh, your critical decision-making on, I, I really think she's more imminent than this, or we don't have time to get to the hospital because maybe I have an hour-long transport, which some of the folks on this program do. Um, or maybe you need to start heading toward the hospital knowing that, hey, I think I'm probably going to deliver this baby. I just, I just want to make as much progress as getting closest to the hospital as I possibly can. But um, just know that if mom's having regular contractions, they're lasting for almost a minute, they're one to two minutes apart, you're probably going to be delivering baby. If mom has an urge to bear down or has a sensation of a bowel movement, that's another sign uh, of imminent delivery, right? Uh, if any of you have have made these types of runs, mom has probably said, can I just go to the bathroom real quick? And generally we'll do everything we can to dissuade her and tell her why uh, we're, uh, we're dissuading her because um, she may not necessarily have to use the restroom. Um, she's probably feeling the weight and pressure of baby moving down lower into the vaginal canal for delivery. Obviously, if you see crowning, um, that is a very imminent sign of delivery. And if mom tells you that she believes she's getting ready to deliver the baby, you should probably believe her. I put that in the category of um, generally, if a patient tells me they're going to die, they're probably going to die. Um, if a mom tells me that she believes she's getting ready to, to have the baby or that she needs to push, she's probably right and she's probably getting ready to have the baby. Preparing for delivery. This is probably the biggest shortfall that, that we have um, pre-hospitally besides just not having a ton of exposure to deliveries to begin with is knowing your equipment. Um, you know, right now, if, if each of you walk out to your medic unit, I'd be willing to the majority and it's the same way at Hebron's too. So, you know, I'm not throwing stones. Ma the, the majority of OB kits are in a sealed box with cellophane or they're in a sealed, uh, you know, clear envelope style package uh, where you can't open up anything and see anything. You're relying on, you know, that, that packing list on the front of the, uh, the package or the front of the box to tell you what's in there. Open it up. Um, you know, talk to whoever orders your supplies, uh, ask them to order an extra one that you can have for training that you can just open and see exactly what is in this thing. Where is it located? Um, how do we operate it? Right. What type of clamps are in there? Do we have a scalpel? Or do we have scissors? Um, I would recommend using a surgical scissors instead of a scalpel. Um, just because the scalpel is extremely sharp. Um, and, and this is going to be one of those kind of uh, low frequency, high risk runs where, where nerves are already amped up and you have a lot of adrenaline going. Um, but do you have towels? Do you have surgical masks? Are there gowns? Um, is the bulb syringe in there? Do you have hats? Which everyone knows is, is probably, you know, top three most important things in there. Never take a baby, especially a newborn into the hospital without a hat. Is there a diaper in there? Um, some of your people that you're probably sitting with right now have never even put a diaper on a baby. Um, so think about that, right? Maybe uh, it sounds pretty, pretty, pretty juvenile to do, but but maybe uh, uh, for some of the younger people at your department, maybe they need to see how a diaper goes on. Um, and a plastic bag, like a red biohazard bag for, for placenta transport, if you happen to deliver the placenta while you're on scene. So delivery steps, BSI and PPE. Um, I have never been in my career a huge, uh, I wear gloves on every EMS run, of course, but I've never been a huge uh, um, person into to, to other types of PPE from goggles to, to gowns and stuff like that. Uh, I just never have been. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, certainly. But this is a type of run where if you have a piece of PPE, you probably want to put it on. So throughout the delivery uh, process, crowning occurs. When you start to see um, baby crowning, go ahead and apply some gentle counter pressure to the fetus's head to help prevent an explosive delivery because that's going to cause some tearing for mom. Um, as the head delivers, immediately look for a nuchal cord, and I'm going to show you what a nuchal cord looks like um, here in the next few slides, but that's when the umbilical cord has became wrapped around the baby's neck. Grab the baby's head with their hands over the ears to support the head. As it rotates for, that should, should say, shoulder presentation, we, most of the time, we don't need to, to rotate baby at all. Let baby naturally rotate as mom pushes. 
If the shoulders do not deliver with the next contraction, gently guide the fetal head downward to deliver the anterior shoulder. So the shoulder that is pointing up towards the top of your ambulance and then upward for the posterior shoulder to deliver. Uh, once the shoulders are through, the rest of the baby is going to deliver very, very quickly. Make sure that you have towels, clean sheets, something um, to grab the baby and support the baby because <clears throat> the baby is going to be very slippery. Um, and again, you're in the back of a medic unit. It's not exactly like completely ideal situation, nor is it anything. Uh, uh, it couldn't be any further from sterile. Suctioning, we'll talk about that. Um, dry the newborn with sterile towels and cover the newborn, especially the head, to reduce heat loss, record sex, and time of birth. So this is um, an in-cal delivery. Um, this is something that, um, honestly, I, did, I didn't really know uh, was a thing until uh, I left Newport in 2018, and I went to the Cleveland Clinic for a few years to, to run their EMS education. And actually, while I was there, so I worked in downtown Akron, Akron Fire, had one of these deliveries. Um, and it, that was kind of my true first exposure to it. But it is when the baby is born in an intact amniotic sac. Um, so we don't have anything in our protocols, at least here in Northern Kentucky, we don't. That really explains what to do about that. So obviously my advice is if that happens, contact medical control. But it might be a good conversation to, to have with your medical director now um, because it may or may not be a situation where we have time to get on the phone with medical control and ask for guidance. Um, it, it's simple. It's essentially just stripping, the, breaking the sac and stripping the membranes away from the baby's face. Um, but it's pretty interesting to know that it can happen through a vaginal delivery. It's extremely rare. But like I said, uh, in my few years um, in Akron, Akron Fire actually had one of these. It was, it was a pretty interesting case. So um, ignore the uh, kind of overall talk and, and narrative of what's happening in the video. Uh, I really just wanted you guys to see what this in-cow delivery look like. So baby's delivered, baby's still in an intact amniotic sac right there. They're getting ready to break the sac to puncture the sac, and then they'll strip that membranes and the sac away from the baby's face. And the baby's been delivered. So again, I don't, uh, hopefully, you know, none of us encounter that, but know that it is a real possibility and it can't happen through a vaginal delivery. Um, I'd rather you find out about it here and maybe never have to, to, to use it or remember what it's called than find out about it on Sunday uh, and have no idea that it's possible or what you should even do for it. So it, it's certainly a good thing to uh, maybe reach out to uh, whoever's in charge of your EMS or to your, to your medical director to, to get some guidance of, hey, if this happens, what exactly do you want us to do for it? Um, and what exactly is the kind of the procedure of, of breaking that that sac and, and stripping the membranes away from the the, uh, the the baby's face? So meconium staining, suctioning. So we were always taught for years and years and years with every single delivery, we immediately suction the baby um, with a bulb syringe. And we do that in what order? Most of you probably just said mouth then nose, um, and you are correct. So that has changed, and it's changed with AHA uh, recommendations and PALS recommendations that we are only going to suction when meconium staining is present, and there are signs and symptoms of associated difficulty breathing. So we really kind of uh, progress from we suction every single baby every single time to we only suction babies with meconium staining. Now we're at a point of we only suction babies with meconium staining and who are having associated difficulty breathing um, signs and symptoms because of the meconium staining. Now, if we need to do that, we will still do the same order of mouth then nose. Um, uh, but just know that we're not routinely suctioning babies anymore. And the reason for that is, is that reflex bradycardia, um, <clears throat> when we suction babies, we're actually causing them to brady down. Um, and we are, uh, we're much better off um, trying to have the baby clear those things um, on his or her own, opposed to suctioning baby and having them Brady down, um, you know, five minutes into the world. So newborn evaluation, the APGAR score, this is something that uh, I don't expect anyone to really commit to memory. However, uh, if you think of it in its simplest terms, it's, it's pretty easy to come up with a, with a fairly accurate score. So with the APGAR score, 10 is the best possible condition that you can get. 
Um, generally, uh, no baby in the pre-hospital setting is probably going to score a 10, but really even in the hospital setting, we're probably going to be looking at, you know, sevens and eights, hopefully. Hopefully we're not any lower than that, but 10 is the best possible condition. Seven to nine is you know, generally normal newborn. Four to six is a moderately depressed newborn. Zero to three is severely depressed. If the score comes up to be less than six, that kid is likely going to need some type of resuscitation. Now, it doesn't mean they're going to work their way through that entire inverted pyramid, which we're going to look at, uh, but it might mean they need more than just a routine stimulation of warming, drying, tactile stimulation, you know, potential suctioning if, if necessary. They might need some blow by oxygen. They might need some positive pressure ventilations, or God forbid, they need chest compressions and medications. But with the APGAR, it looks at a total of five different areas, and they are scored from zero to two points. So zero essentially means it is the worst case scenario. There is no, um, uh, it's completely absent um, in that particular category. It's ungradable. And two points means everything is fantastic. It could not be any better. So therefore, one is somewhere right in between. So with activity, that's the patient's muscle tone or the newborn's muscle tone. So um, do they have no muscle tone at all? Uh, they're just com completely limp. Do they have flexed arms and legs? So they're moving their arms and legs a little bit, or are they active? They're moving all around, uh, moving all extremities, which is hopefully what we want to see. Pulse, zero points for no pulse at all. One point for a pulse below 100 beats per minute. Two, two points for a pulse over 100 beats per minute. Grimace, um, do they have, um, are they floppy? They have no movement at all. One point, they get minimal response to stimulation. Two points, they get prompt response to stimulation. So essentially, um, as we're drying them off, as we're warming them, as we're putting the hat on, as we're doing all of those things, are they responding to us doing that? Do they have no response to us doing that at all? Um, or are they trying to fight us, right? Which is hopefully what we want to see. Appearance is their skin color. Zero points if they are blue or pale all over, so centrally and, and extremities. One point if they have a pink body, so they're pink centrally, but they have blue extremities. And two points if they're pink all over, which uh, I have three kids. Um, none of them would have gotten two points uh, for appearance. Um, all of them had blue extremities when they came out. Um, it's nothing really to, to freak out about. Um, most kids are, are probably not going to be completely pink when they're born. Respiration, zero points is they have no respirations at all. One point is they have slow and irregular respirations. And two points is they have a vigorous cry, which is what we're shooting for. So again, pre-hospitally, we're probably going to see something around seven or eight. Um, a score of less than six generally corresponds with needing some type of resuscitation, which we'll, we'll talk about in a few moments. So upon delivery, keep baby, well, I should, uh, I'll be remiss if I did not say, for APGAR scoring, this happens at one and five minutes after birth. So one minute after delivery, we get an APGAR score. Five minutes after delivery, we get an APGAR score, and we should be trending positively with those. So when we do deliver baby, keep baby at or below the level of the placenta. So what we don't want to do, as soon as baby's delivered, um, the baby is still attached to the umbilical cord. What we don't want to do is lift baby real high, right? And that's probably first instinct. Um, but when we're doing that, we're putting the baby above the level of the placenta, which is ultimately supplying baby with that last bit of um, oxygenated blood, nutrients, red blood cells, hemoglobin, iron, all of those things. Um, and we could actually cause quite a bit of, of hypoperfusion or hypotension in that baby. So until that cord is clamped and cut, try to keep the baby at or below the level of the placenta. So it's really going to be at or below the level of mom. So the cord should have stopped pulsating <clears throat> prior to cutting. Cord should be clamped, but try to delay that 30 seconds to one minute in term and preterm babies who do not need resuscitation. So if baby's born, baby's good, APGAR's good, acting appropriately, try to wait 30 seconds to a minute in term or preterm babies who don't need any type of resuscitative efforts. And we're going to talk about why that is in the next slide. Um, clamp the cord four to six inches away from the newborn in two places. So put the first one four inches away from newborn, the second one six inches away from the newborn. Um, so we have a two-inch um, spot of umbilical cord there that we can cut. 
cut between the two clamps with scissors or a scalpel. Um, make sure the ends are not bleeding. They shouldn't be if they're clamped. Um, if they are bleeding, don't take the clamp off. It's just like a tourniquet. Don't take it off. Just put another clamp on and hopefully we can get those ends to stop bleeding. So delayed cord clamping. Um, this was really something that came out, uh, I don't know, to, to my knowledge, I'd say within the past five years where it's really gained traction um, of waiting that 30 seconds, 30 to 60 seconds and, and good healthy babies before we um, put our two clamps on and cut. So in 2023, the American College of uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology um, released a, a re released a research study, and that research study said that delayed cord clamping increased hemoglobin levels and iron storage for the first several years of life. These babies did have a small increase in jaundice, um, but generally it was cleared up by the time they left the hospital, as long as the hospital recognized it and put them under the heat lamp and did those types of things. Um, and it did, does not increase the risk of postpartum hemorrhage. So there was initially some concern or some discussion that uh, we think uh, delaying the cord clamping and cutting increases the risk of postpartum hemorrhage, but that was actually not found. <clears throat> the University of Sydney in Australia in 2021 put out a uh, the largest study of delayed cord cutting, and it was a two-year study. And what they did is they monitored 1,500, uh, just over 1,500 babies that were born before 30 weeks. So these were all preterm babies in 25 different hospitals from seven different countries. And what they found was those babies who had delayed cord cutting, they had a decreased early risk of death and or major disability by 17% through early childhood. So not just through its first one month of life or its infancy, through its early childhood. So let's call it toddler age one to three years of age, um, 30 to 60 seconds in the very beginning of being born and with delayed cord clamping, decreased risk of death and major disability by 17%. 30% decrease in mortality by age two and 15% fewer infants needed blood transfusions. I mean, it's 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 pretty, uh, it's pretty eye-opening to me that in 30 to 60 seconds, the first 30 to 60 seconds of the baby's life can by doing something that costs us no extra money, no extra training, just a little bit of education can have that profound of an impact for the first two to three years of life. I mean, it's pretty phenomenal to me. If this was applied worldwide and very preterm babies, again, they were looking at this for really preterm kids, it can cause an extra 50,000 babies to survive without major disability over the next 10 years. So again, something that doesn't doesn't uh, involve any extra training, no extra money to have that profound of an impact. Um, I think all of us should should put it into practice immediately. Um, of of if we we deliver in the field, baby's doing well, mom's doing well. Try to wait thirty to sixty seconds until that cord stops pulsating before we clamp it and and, and cut it. Neonatal resuscitation. So I mentioned this earlier. This is the inverted pyramid of neonatal resuscitation. The very first step, uh, which hopefully that's where we end on all of our kids that we deliver, um, is warm, dry positioning, suctioning, and stimulation. Again, we already talked about suctioning. I won't, I won't rehash it there. Um, probably won't need to do it at all. Um, but if we do, it would be, it would be there in the beginning as, as we're delivering baby. If the baby still needs resuscitation above and beyond the warming, drying, positioning phase, then we move on to oxygen, and we're talking blow by oxygen. Um, if the heart rate's less than 100, we're talking blow by oxygen with a non rebreather, um, enough to try to stimulate the baby um, to try to get him or her more active or crying more or whatever, whatever areas might be depressed in that baby, um, trying to get the heart rate up. That's what we're trying to accomplish there. We're going to do that for 30 seconds. Okay. Now, each one of these steps we should do for 30 seconds before we go on to the next one. Now, that does not mean that if we deliver a pulseless and apneic baby, we should do blow by oxygen for 30 seconds, then we should do room air ventilation for 30 seconds until we can finally do chest compressions. It does not mean that. But what it means is we deliver baby, obviously, hopefully baby has a pulse, um, baby's breathing, they're just not doing as good as what we'd like them to be doing. We're gonna start with oxygen for 30 seconds, then we're gonna move on to ventilation for 30 seconds, and we're going to do that with room air ventilation. Um, generally, room air ventilation is, is exactly what is needed. 
you can use oxygen. Um, follow your protocols for that, but the room air ventilation is generally what's called for. The endotracheal intubation, uh, I would personally argue to move that down lower towards medications. And in some inverted pyramids, you'll actually find where endotracheal intubation is the very last thing that you do. Um, so I think that third step should be more heavily concentrated on effective ventilation before we start tubing kids. So if 30 seconds has gone by, we've been doing positive pressure ventilations with room air. We're still not seeing the effects we want to go to. Now we can go to chest compressions if that heart rate is less than 60. Um, and then we can continue to work our way down into medications and into, uh, like I said, uh, where I would put intubation, you know, near the last along with medications. So remember that inverted pyramid, your protocol is ultimately going to supersede all of this and, and the flow. Um, we have varying protocols that, that, that use our CE program. So I don't necessarily want to stick to one, um, but I would encourage you to at least know the inverted pyramid of neonatal resuscitation and the overall premise of it. At the end of the day, your protocol uh, for neonatal resuscitation is, is going to guide you in exactly uh, what you need to do and when you need to do it. So preductal pulse oximetry. So, so this is something that is very important, I think, for to, to, to convey. When you deliver a baby, um, baby is never going to have a good pulse oximetry. And I don't, I think this is also something that's not talked about enough. And I think that if, if we didn't know this, we deliver baby, um, SpO2 is probably going to be pretty far down on our on our uh, totem pole of things to accomplish. But let's just say we're being you know super efficient that day. We put baby on the pulse ox and the pulse ox is 63%. We're probably going to freak out about it, right? Because 63 is really, really bad. That's incredibly hypoxic. At least that's what our brains are trained to think. So that is not necessarily the case. It's not the case with a newborn. So a normal SpO2 after birth, one minute is 60 to 65%. Two minutes, 65 to 70%. Three minutes, 70 to 75%. Four minutes, 75 to 80. Five minutes, 80 to 85. 10 minutes, 85 to 95. So it could take nearly 10 minutes after delivery for that baby to actually have a good SpO2. Okay, so um, keep that in mind. Um, there is a difference between preductal and postductal SpO2 as well. Um, postductal SpO2 is going to be way behind these percentages. It's going to be way delayed. What we mean by this is this talk. This is uh, referring to the ductus arteriosus. So if you remember, when babies are in utero, their uh, blood is not going to their lungs to become oxygenated because their babies aren't taking breaths with it when they're in utero. So remember. Um, blood is crossing from the right side to the left side through that ductus arteriosus. When baby's born and baby starts taking first breaths, that's when that ductus arteriosus starts the very beginning process of closing and baby to, to have normal perfusion. Preductal SpO2 is talking about SpO2 measurements um, in the arms and the fingers. Postductal SpO2 is like uh, getting SpO2 readings off the foot or off the toe. Those are going to be way behind the preductal SpO2 readings. Big takeaway here is if you deliver a kid, you put them on a pulse ox, don't freak out if, if they have low SpO2 readings. It is normal. Hence why room air ventilation is generally um, what's recommended for these kids instead of blasting them with 100% oxygen uh, through ventilation. Placental delivery. So the placenta is typically delivered within 20 minutes. Do not delay transport for this. So it's not something that we need to hang around and wait on scene for. Do not pull on the umbilical cord. Um, it can cause detachment uh, from the cord from the placenta, which is not good. It's going to cause hemorrhaging. Um, it can also cause the placenta itself to tear. Uh, the mom will deliver the placenta on her own accord. We don't need to delay transport for it. It's not a real big deal. Um, she's going to have some contractions that she's going to push through to deliver the placenta, but we do not want to pull on the umbilical cord. It's not our job to force that. You'll see if you've been in the hospital for uh, for one of your own kids, or if you've been a part of a delivery through for, through clinical rotations, you probably saw the OB doc pull on the umbilical cord. That's their prerogative. They can fix that. They know what they're doing. They know what they're looking for. We don't. So do not pull on the umbilical cord. Let that process happen on its own. Um, like I said, mom will bear down with contractions to deliver the placenta, place the placenta in a plastic bag or some other type of container and transport it with the mother and the newborn. 
that is important so that the placenta can be um, <clears throat> looked at by the doc to make sure that it is fully intact. They don't think that the placenta um, had any type of tearing, which if it's left in utero, it's going to cause a pretty significant infection down the road. Um, so it is very important to take the placenta with us if it happens to be delivered during our care. Multiple gestation. So this is pregnancy with more than one fetus. Twin births occur in approximately 30% of every 1,000 live births. So about 300 of every 1,000 are twin births. Twins should be delivered identically. However, up to 50% of second twin deliveries are not in a normal position. So in up to 50% of twin deliveries, the second baby is generally breech. Um, it could be a frank breech presentation, which is buttocks first. It could be a limb presentation. Um, but generally, that second twin and up to 50% of, of twin deliveries, they're in a breech position. Um, and uh, the OBs might have to... Um, uh, try to do some different techniques for mom to deliver vaginally, or they might have to do a C-section. After the first twin is delivered, clamp and cut the umbilical cord as we described previously. So you're going to treat each baby as its own delivery. And the process just resets for second baby. So first baby's born, <clears throat> the crowning's there. We're, put, we're putting um, counter pressure against the head to make sure that mom doesn't have an explosive delivery and causes unnecessary tearing. We're, we're uh, supporting the baby's head uh, around its ears, allowing for it to naturally rotate to get the anterior and posterior shoulder out. Um, we're out checking for a nuchal cord as the head does come out. Once baby's out, um, wait your 30 to 60 seconds for delayed cord clamping if you can, if the situation allows for it. Clamp, clamp, cut. Then five to 10 minutes. Um uh, the delivery is going to, to start again. Labor is going to happen again, and that second baby is going to be delivered. So just know that uh, it, it does happen and can happen, but generally it's not this like one minute difference. Um, it seems like, like every every set of twins I know, it's like it, she was born one minute before me. Um, none of them were born 30 minutes apart, right? It's always a minute. Um, generally, that's not how it happens. It, there's usually some time there in between them. Um, to where it's going to take labor uh, a couple minutes to start again, and mom's going to have to go through the whole delivery process again for the second baby. So, I mean, we could be talking 30 to 45 minutes after the first baby's been delivered. So, it's just going to be two separate deliveries that you're doing. Think of it that way. With that, depending on where you are and depending on your transport time, you might be able to get away with transporting before that second twin is delivered, or again, at least making your way towards the hospital so you can get as close to the hospital as possible. Because now you're going to go from having one patient in the very beginning and mom to two patients with the delivery of baby to three patients with the delivery of the second baby. Um, and again, that, that might require additional resources and additional ambulances depending on everybody's status. Delivery complications. <clears throat> so umbilical cord prolapse. This is when the umbilical cord passes through the cervix at the same time or in advance of the fetus, and that cord can become compressed against the fetus by the baby, which diminishes fetal oxygenation from, from the placenta. That is not good. Um, and this actually happens pretty frequently. So it occurs in, uh, in one out of every 10 deliveries. So some predisposing factors of this, a breach presentation, lack of prenatal care, if there's twins, gestational diabetes, why? because those babies are just naturally larger. Usually those babies are not vaginal deliveries, they're C-sections um, and preterm labor. So if we have an umbilical cord prolapse, the first thing we're going to do is check to see if the cord is pulsating. So we're gonna grab the cord and we're gonna see if we feel a pulse in that cord. If we do, that is great news. Our next steps is to take a, a, a sterile dressing um, put sterile water on that sterile dressing and wrap the cord so that it is, does not become dried out um, as it's uh, um, uh, prolapsed from the vagina. We do need to check that cord every few minutes to make sure that that pulse remains. Me personally, I'm going to hold on to that cord probably for the rest of transport just to make sure that I'm consistently feeling a pulse because at any second, I can no longer feel a pulse if the, if the cord uh, changes positions or if baby changes positions. If we don't feel a pulse in that cord, now things um, are going to become a little bit more difficult. So <clears throat> we are going to take a gloved hand and insert two fingers into mom's vagina. And we are going to try to find baby's head and try to move the baby's head 
off of the cord. So we're going to continue to try to move the baby off of the cord until we feel that cord pulsating again. Um, if you're able to achieve that, don't be surprised if you're going all the way to labor and delivery and ultimately the OR um, with mom um, for the C-section to happen. That cord has got to have a pulse. It's like an artery. It is an artery, right? If we don't have uh, a pulse going through that cord, that means baby is not getting oxygen and baby is not getting blood. Bad day. So we have to do everything we can to try to restore that pulse in the cord um, for mom and baby throughout transport. If we can't achieve it that way, you might be able to put mom on all fours on the stretcher. That's what every um, paramedic textbook says. It's also what every article about um, prolapse cords talks about. I don't really know how you're going to safely transport mom at that point in time. You might have to also put mom in a knee chest position. Anything you can do to try to let gravity help you get baby off, um, off of that umbilical cord is what you're going to need to do because this can very, very quickly turn into a, a really bad day for us and mom and baby if we don't get a pulse restored in that umbilical cord. Nuchal cord. So I've, I've said this phrase numerous times here. If while we're, as soon as while we're delivering baby, the first thing we should be doing, really even before we can see the baby's neck, is try to be feeling baby's neck to see if we can feel the cord wrapped around. If we can feel that cord wrapped around the baby's neck, we need to immediately begin to try to work to get that cord unraveled. Um, if we cannot get that cord unraveled from the baby's neck, you're going to clamp it in two spots and cut it immediately. I don't care where. You're just going to clamp, clamp, and cut. Um, we kind of lose uh, the, the the fancy techniques and the four to six inches. We lose all that when we're talking about a nuchal cord um, that is stuck around the baby's neck. If we don't get that off, that's obviously going to cause asphyxiation. And I mean, just in this picture alone on the left side of your screen, that's, that's, a, that's a pretty scary image to look at. So as soon as we see that, hopefully we can get the cord slipped off um, and away from the baby's head. If we can, perfect, just do that. Continue to, your delivery as normal. If you cannot achieve that because the cord is too tight or if it has a, uh, a knot in it, you're just going to have to clamp in two spots and cut it uh, as soon as you see it. So that is a nuchal cord. Postpartum hemorrhage. So this is when there is more than 500 milliliters of blood loss after delivery. Um, that occurs within the first 24 hours from delivery. So it's not just with delivery. It's within the first 24 hours of delivery. If there is more than 500 milliliters of blood loss, that is considered a postpartum hemorrhage. This accounts for 25% of obstetric deaths. So there's two things that we can do that are not medication related to try to help um, control postpartum hemorrhage and to try to increase uterine contraction. The first is the fundal massage, which we already talked about. Remember, the fundus at term is going to be near that xiphoid process. As soon as delivery happens, that fundus is going to work its way back down to the level of the belly button. Try to do a fundal massage. That'll help do a, um, um, stimulate uterine contraction. Second thing we could do is try to encourage um, newborn breastfeeding. Even if, if, if mom doesn't want to do the breastfeeding route, that's fine. Um, that's not up to us uh, one way or another. But I would highly recommend you try to do your best at talking mom into at least attempting it now. Um, because of the postpartum hemorrhage and explaining that. So the newborn um, attempting to breastfeed, that stimulates oxytocin in mom um, from that posterior pituitary gland, and that causes uh, uterine contraction. Um, so if we can get mom to, to start releasing oxytocin on her own, which is generally um, stimulated by, by the newborn trying to breastfeed, that's also going to help naturally um, cause the, the uterus to contract. And our protocols in the Southwest Ohio, Northern Kentucky protocols, if you're in our region, um, our protocols allow for TXA, so tranexamic acid, one gram and 100 milliliters over 10 minutes. That is the infusion. Um, I do think, don't, don't take this to the bank or anything, but I do think uh, sometime in the near future, we'll, we'll see that raise the two grams for TXA. Uh, but it's currently one gram, even in the 2024 version, it's one gram and 100 mil, uh, mLs over 10 minutes. <clears throat> Not in protocol is oxytocin. And I know of at least one agency here in Northern Kentucky that, that carried Pitocin. I worked there um, part-time and we carried Pitocin and this was exactly why. 
that dose is 10 units and a uh, one liter bag infused at 20 to 30 drops per minute. Amniotic fluid embolism. So this is when amniotic fluid enters maternal circulation during labor delivery or immediately after through some small lacerations in the uterine veins or the uterine segment. This occurs in 6 to 14.8 per 100,000 deliveries, um, which is a little bit more than one one hundredth of a percent. Um, so pretty rare. However, maternal mortality rate is high. So I think because the uh, maternal mortality rate is so high with this, um, it's in the national EMS education standards. It's expected to be taught in paramedic school. It is absolutely on the national registry exam. Um, and uh, even though it occurs incredibly infrequently, and I'm thankful it does, uh, but because maternal mortality rate is so high with this, um, it is something that's uh, passed down to EMS providers. So the signs and symptoms of this is going to be the same as that as with a pulmonary embolism. So you're going to have a rapid onset of difficulty breathing, rapid onset of chest pain, tachypnea, so that increased rate and work of breathing, and tachycardia. 